So hello everyone. Today we have uh, Dr. Ranshar Stienville, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Dr. Stienville holds a PhD in Solid Mechanics, Material Science and Mechanical Engineering uh, from France. And his uh, expertise and contributions to material science include uh, deep understanding of microstructure effects on of structural alloys. His research covered nickel plate superalloys and steels for nuclear applications. So Dr. Sinel has multiple awards, including best research paper published in experimental mechanics and his uh, PhD thesis received the highest uh, distinction from the French educational system. And today, uh, Dr. Stinwell will talk about slip localization and prediction of fatigue of uh, polycrystalline alloys. With that, uh, I will pass it to Dr. Stinwell and welcome to the seminar. Thank you, Marat, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you for attending this uh, seminar. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a fatty property of uh, polycrystalline alloys, so fatty strengths. And uh, the idea for me was to relate this to the plastic localization that developed uh, during uh, fatty. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge my co-author at uh, UIUC, but also at the uh, University of San, uh, California, Santa Barbara, and uh, Institute Prime. I also want to acknowledge uh, GE and the Department of Energy for the research funding. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am going to detail the uh, uh, fatigue strengths of uh, metallic material, and I'm trying to uh, with this study to uh, link uh, fatty strengths to the deformation processes that occur at a very small scale du uh, during cycling. So I like to present this plot here on the left, where you have the fatty strengths uh, given, given as a function of the yield strengths or ultimate tensile strengths for all kinds of uh, metals, alloys, uh, super alloys, uh, steel, copper, titanium, and also uh, some uh, BCC uh, alloys. And so as you can see, the fatigue strengths uh, tend to increase uh, for high yield strengths materials. There is another way to present the data. It's what I am doing uh, in this middle plot here. So here I display the fatigue strengths again, but that's a percentage of the yield strengths or the ultimate tensile strengths. And I display this value, it's what we uh, usually refer as a fatigue ratio. It's indicative of the efficiency of an alloy in a fatigue. And I display this value as a function, again, of the yield strength or ultimate tensile strength of the alloy. Here you can see that materials that display high yield strength, they tend to have a very low efficiency in fatigue, meaning that they do not sustain a very high number of uh, fatigue cycle. And so, for instance, if you look at uh, copper alloys that display a quite relative low yield strength, the fatigue strength can be higher than um, its yield strength. However, for a structural material, let's say a super alloy or steel, uh, the fatigue strength can be as low as 40% of their yield strength. And so it's also for this reason, fatigue, fatigue is a very, very critical property for uh, structural materials. And the idea of this study was to understand why. And um, we know quite a lot about uh, fatigue. And uh, the first information we have is that the mechanism or, of damage that occurred during fatigue are related to a um, mechanism of uh, deformation mechanisms that occur uh, during this uh, cyclic loading. I like to display one example here on a nickel based super alloy. So it's an alloy that kind of alloys that are used for 
uh, eye temperature application. Um, I display here on the left the microstructure of this alloy, the grain structure. Uh, so you see all the crystallographic grains with different crystallographic orientation. And with this kind of alloy, you can process them in different way. Uh, the typical way to process is by doing an aging treatment where you uh, develop precipitate uh, during uh, aging. And that give to this alloy a very high yield strength. And it's what uh, I did for this, this 718 nickel based super alloy. And you obtain this red curve, stress strain curve here. And the alloy display yield strength higher than 1000 MPa. You can also process the alloy uh, in a different way where you do not do uh, this edging step, but you just do a quench and uh, during uh, processing, and you do not form any precipitates. Um, and in this case, you obtain an alloy th uh, that is strengthened by solid solution. And you obtain this blue curve when you do a monotonic tensile test. And typically you obtain yield strength for this specific grain structure around 300 uh, MPa. So here it's a way to process two alloys with you have the same chemistry for both of these alloys. You have the same grain structure, the same texture, etc. But one alloy is, is strengthened by precipitation and display a very high yield, and the other alloy is strengthened by a solid solution and display a relative low uh, yield strength. Then we tested the specimen in fatigue in the very high cycle fatty regime. Uh, where you apply a large number of, of uh, cycle, and this allows you to uh, capture the fatigue strength of uh, the alloy. And we notice that the initiation, uh, crack initiation pro process is uh, pretty similar between both alloys. You initiate a longer crystallographic facet. And the most surprising results is this plot here, where I display the maximum stress uh, during a uh, cyclic loading. So I apply a ten, uh, ratio of minus one, so tension and compression during fatigue. And I display this uh, as a, uh, as a here, the fatigue life as a function of the maximum stress, apply stress. For we perform different uh, tests here. And by doing that, you can determine the fatigue strengths here in the very high cycle fatigue regime. So at 10 to the nine uh, cycle. And you can see, despite this huge difference in yield strength, you obtain a very similar uh, fatigue strength. So it was quite surprising for, uh, for us. And you can display this uh, result on the previous uh, plot I mentioned. So the fatigue strength as a percent of the yield strength, for instance. And here it's given uh, as a function of the yield strength. And again, you see that the uh, uh, nickel-based superalloy in a solid solution form uh, display a very high efficiency in fatigue. And the, the one with a precipitate, precipitate uh, structure display a very low uh, fatigue efficiency. You are close to uh, 20%. The fatigue strength is close to 20% of the year strength. And we investigate a uh, different kind of alloy here to uh, try to find why you have this kind of uh, relation between yield strength and fatigue strength, and why materials that display very high yield strength display a very low uh, fatigue strength efficiency. So we know quite a lot about fatigue, and in this regime, the very high cycle fatigue regime, so where you determine or high cycle fatigue regime where you determine your fatigue strength. We know that the fatigue life is mainly controlled by uh, crack initiation. And the crack initiation is controlled by mechanisms that occur at the nanometer scale and that involves the localization of the plasticity. I just show two examples from the literature here on a copper alloy where you see this uh, persistently band, so feature, uh, where you have high localization of plasticity and the crack uh, initiate nucleate from these specific uh, features. And you can see these features, they extend 
on a quite large region, few microns. At the bottom, you have another example, but from a nickel-based superalloy that display very high yield strength here with the precip precipitate, precipitation strengthen alloys. And when you do a fatigue testing on this kind of alloy, you notice that the localization of the plasticity is confined in a very small region uh, in the range of few uh, tens of nanometers. And during initiation, you can even see during cycling, you can even see extrusion of materials because you have this very high localization and the crack initiate from, from that. So you start to, to see that depends of the material, you have different kind of uh, localizations that occur during cycling. And we wanted to investigate that, so we use a different tool to do that. So first, we use high resolution digital image correlation in order to capture the localization of the plasticity at very small scale and as a function of the microstructure. So that's the tool we use to uh, uh, investigate the localization of plasticity. We also wanted to relate this to the fatigue property and especially fatigue strengths. So we use very high cycle fatigue testing to do that. Uh, with this kind of uh, frame, you can apply a large number of cycles per second. So typically, typically you work at 20 kilohertz and you can apply 20,000 cycles uh, per second. It's a way to uh, test very rapidly your, uh, or to obtain very rapidly your fatigue strength. So I am going to detail uh, this high resolution digital image correlation uh, technique. So in order to obtain the process of uh, plastic localization, we use our resolution DIC inside the SEM to have a sufficient resolution to capture these uh, small features, plastic location features or events. So we use uh, in situ stages uh, inside the SEM and we acquire images before and after deformation. We also, uh, for more complex loading, such as fatigue, uh, we use uh, ex situ testing. So in this case, we are taking images before deformation, and then we are loading the specimen. We can apply one cycle, and then we are putting the specimen back to the microscope, and, taking, and we are taking images after deformation. We are only capturing the residual uh, plasticity when you do ex situ testing. So DIC is a quite simple technique. So you apply a speaker as, um, at, at the surface of your specimen, and you track the displacement of this speaker uh, during deformation. And from the displacement field, you can obtain your strain field. And if you have sufficient resolution um, of your speaker and um, of your DIC for the DIC method and et cetera, the parameter you use for DIC, you are able to capture all the deformation events that occur at the surface of the specimen or in the first layer of grain of the specimen. And is what I display here on the, on the right. You see this band, so all the math Material I investigated in this study, all the metallic material I investigated, uh, they form uh, by slip. So you obtain slip uh, bands at the surface of the uh, specimen, slip traces at the surface of the specimen. And if you have a sufficient resolution by DIC, you can capture all these uh, slip events. However, as you can see on the left, if your resolution is not enough, you tend to average the strain over a large region and you are not able to resolve each of these uh, slip events. And sometimes you are not even able to capture the most intense uh, localized event. So it's just really necessary to have a very high resolution to capture the localization of the plasticity in this kind of uh, alloys that they form by slip. Uh, we also develop a specific DIC we also develop a specific DIC code uh, to uh, um, quantify the localization 
of the plasticity by sleep. So if you consider a sleep end, you can see here on the left, and if you consider images before and after deformation, uh, sleep is a discontinuity, and conventional DIC code doesn't deal very well with uh, discontinuities. You can only capture gradient of displacement. Uh, so what I display on the left, you can see uh, it's a nickel-based superalloy again. You can see all the precipitates, and you can see a slip trace uh, that uh, uh, the surface of the specimen. And you can even uh, see the step induced by this uh, slip localization. So this comes from the emergence of the dislocation of the surface of the specimen. So if you have a code that can capture these continuities, you will be able to quantify the intensity of this uh, sleep event. And so the code, the code we use is uh, EBSI DIC. So when you do DIC, typically you divide your image in small subsets and you track the displacement of these subsets on the deformed image between the initial and the deformed uh, state. Here with AV side, you also use the subset, but you have a function to an AV side function to divide the subset in a multiple parts. Sorry, I will. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have a function, we use a function, the AV side function, to divide the subset in multiple parts. And by doing that, you can capture this continuity inside your subset. So what you can do is identify if a subset uh, contain a discontinuity. You can identify the, the location of the discontinuity. And you can also identify the amplitude of the discontinuity. And if you do apply this for metals that are deformed by sleep, what you obtain when you have a localization or when you form a slip band, you obtain this green vector that indicates of the intensity and of the direction of the slip. It's very necessary to have this kind of code, code to have a quantitative measurement of the localization, of the plasticity by slip. If you use conventional DIC, as I mentioned, you obtain gradient of displacement, and it's what I display on the left here, is a, a displacement field obtained across a slip event. And you can see it just as a slip band or slip trace, you have, you capture the step, however, you have a gradient of displacement. And when you use codes that can capture discontinuities, then you can really capture accurately this uh, step in use by uh, the slip uh, event, and you can quantify this. And so what, we what you can obtain with this kind of uh, method is uh, this kind of map here. So on the left, you have the strain field. You can correlate this with a microstructure if you use other characterization techniques such as the EBSD. So you can relate all the slip events uh, to as a function of the microstructure. In addition, using the VSI DIC, you can capture the intensity of the localization. So what I display in the middle here, uh, you can capture all the slip events, but you also have the intensity. And here it's uh, the sharing giving in nanometers. And you start to have a quantitative measurement of uh, all, all of this uh, slip event. And you can notice here on this example, so it's a nickel-based superalloy that the most intense bands, slip event, develop near these very small uh, twins here, parallel to the twin. You can also apply this uh, during a cyclic loading, and it's what I display on this uh, slide. So we um, uh, selected a specimen and we loaded the specimen in tension. Uh, you can see the curve on your right, a stress strain curve. And then we unloaded the specimen and we uh, capture the strain field uh, after the tensile part of the cycle. And it's what I display on the left here. So, of course, you develop a lot of slip events. You are in the plastic regime here. Um, and then we loaded the specimen again, but here we apply a 
compressive um, load. And we try to come back to a zero plastic uh, macroscopic deformation. So in order to fully reverse your uh, residual or macroscopic plastic strain. And then if you capture, if you do digital image correlation measurements at the surface of specimen for the exact same region, you can observe that most of the slip ends, they reverse, so they close. However, some of them, and especially near these very small uh, twin boundaries here, uh, they tend to not reverse. And in fatigue is what we call irreversibility. So you have some plastic events that doesn't fully reverse during the compressive load. And then if you continue to cycle, you will initiate damage at this specific location where you have uh, irreversibility. So with this kind of uh, code, you can also uh, investigate um, the, these different features. All of the slip events in this, uh, where you have the very high irreversibility, and it's what I display here. So it's just for a very small region. So on the top is the intensity uh, for each slip event that deform that appear after tension. So for the first cycle, on the left and, and in the middle, it's after compression for the exact same region. So you can see here you have irreversibility because uh, most of the slip ends they uh, did not close during compressive uh, load. At the bottom, I display the direction of the shearing. So if you have a positive value of the angle, it means you have an extrusion. If you have a negative value, like in uh, yellow here, it means you have an intrusion. So here in this kind of cycle, we are coming back to a 0% plastic deformation. So the dis displacement uh, in average is uh, zero after the compressive uh, part. And so what's happened when you have this kind of feature, when you have high irreversibility, uh, is that after tension, you only develop extrusion, of course, but after compression, some of the extrusion doesn't recover, so you don't have uh, reversibility. And you form intrusion. And so you have a schematic at the bottom here. So on the left in, in green, it's a extrusion, and on the right, you have intrusion. And is what we observe uh, during fatigue when you have these specific features uh, during fatigue, for instance, persistence, and et cetera. So you alternate between extrusion and intrusion. So with this kind of tool, we can capture these kind of uh, features. You can do quantitative measurements also. So here again, it's uh, uh, during the first cycle, we apply a tensile part, we did the our resolution DIC, and then we did the compressive uh, load, and we uh, came back to a 0% macroscopic uh, deformation, plastic deformation. And you can investigate a large number of slip events with this uh, technique, and you can extract for each of the slip events the intensity along the slip event, and if the slip event reverse or not, and etc. And it's what I display here for uh, uh, Michael Bessupalo again. Um, you notice that after the uh, fully reverse, so after the first cycle, fully reverse loading, you have still some slip ends that display extrusion character, where you these slip ends they didn't recover during the compressive state, and some of the slip ends display intrusion uh, uh, character, meaning that they occur during the compressive. A lot. So you can uh, really have a quantitative measurement of all of these uh, processes that occur at a very small scale during the formation of metals, especially during uh, cycling. So if we come back on these two examples here uh, of uh, for the nickel uh, based superalloy, which have been processed. Um, uh, with the aging treatment, so you develop precipitate, high yield strength, and the other one is with the solid solution when you uh, do a quench, you don't develop any precipitate. So I mentioned previously that these two alloys they display different fatigue efficiency, with the one 
displaying solid solutions uh, uh, with a very high fatigue efficiency, and the one with a precipitate uh, has a very low fatigue efficiency. And so we did this kind of measurement. So I resolution DIC on this uh, specimen. I just display one uh, map here. So we uh, apply uh, a loading in the plastic regime. We went to uh, uh, a plastic deformation of 1.2% for this alloy with the precipitate. Uh, and so, so you can also quantify all the slip events. And here you can notice that the slip events, they display intensity up to 200 nanometers. Okay. And we did the exact same loading, but for the alloy in the solute solution form. So we apply also a plastic, a macroscopic plastic strain of 1.2%. And you can notice this alloy display more slip bands, and each slip band they have they have very low, all the slip bands they have a very low um, intensity. And so you can start to um, understand that. Um, maybe some the alloy with low yield strains, they tend to develop low intensity. And as a consequence, they are very efficient in fatigue. And the alloy with high yield strains, they tend to localize the plasticity quite, quite a lot. So you have slip and with very high intensity. And as a consequence, they are uh, pretty um, not efficient in fatigue. You can also do quantitative measurements, uh, as I mentioned. You can extract all the slip bands. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, I just want to. So to do this kind of measurements, I just want to detail the, the method. Um, all the map I display up to now was uh, were limited to a, a small region, but you can also do these tests uh, on a very large region. As, uh, as you can see on the left here, it's on a titanium alloy. So it, we did a test on a region of about two millimeter square area. And uh, you can obtain a thousand and thousand of slip events during the formation. You need specific tool to extract all these slip events. You can use either segmentation tool or more advanced tool uh, such as machine learning. And you can extract the profile along this uh, slip event for different kind of uh, materials, uh, different kind of loading it can be during monotonic loading or cyclic loading, and you can do statistical analysis. So in this year, in this uh, study, we extracted uh, along the profile the maximum intensity for all of the slip event, and we did the average of the maximum intensity for all thousand and thousand of sleep events. And we also extracted the most intense uh, sleep events. We did this for uh, all kinds of uh, metals. Uh, so we investigated uh, nickel-based super alloy, uh, steel, titanium, uh, BCC alloys, uh, copper alloys also. So we uh, investigated uh, quite a lot of uh, alloys and we extracted um, the localization of the plasticity using our resolution DIC uh, during monotonic loading, but also during uh, free reverse loading. So just for the first fatigue cycle. And I want to display the results uh, using this plot. So you have the yield strengths on the left. I need to mention that the alloy we investigated, they only deform at room temperature here uh, by sleep. So you have the yield strength of the alloy on this different alloy on the uh, y axis. And on the x axis, you have the maximum intensity for a large number of sleep events. So the dot displays the average of all the, all the obtained intensity. And the bar displays the highest intensity, so the 5% highest intensity over this two millimeter square uh, region during the formation. And here you can capture that for FCC and HCP materials. Uh, if you have high yield strength materials, they tend to develop very high intensity. If you have low yield strength material, they tend to develop quite low intensity. For 
this is a little bit more complicated uh, at room temperature. In average, they tend to display a, a very low intensity because you have all this activation of multiple sleep system. You can also have cross sleep and etc. And the most interesting plot is this one here, where I display the fatigue strength as a percentage of the yield. So the fatigue ratio or the efficiency of an alloy in fatigue as a function of the amplitude of the localization after the first cycle. So it's um, these points are only the 5% highest value of the localization. And you can see you have a direct relation between uh, the efficiency in fatigue of an alloy with the aptitude of the alloy to develop uh, localization. Meaning that if you have uh, developed during the first cycle high localization, then this alloy will not be very efficient in fatigue as a function of the yield strength of the alloy. However, if you have an alloy that displays very low localization after the first cycle, then this alloy is going to be quite efficient in uh, fatigue. So we tested different conditions, different loading conditions. We tested tension compression. We tested uh, just tension. And we also test, did some tests at uh, high temperature, too. but not enough high temperature to develop other initiation processes, such as oxidation. So all the initiation here is related to the location of the plasticity by, uh, by sleep. And so, we have now a relationship between the localization of the plasticity um, and um, the fatigue strength efficiency. When you want to obtain fatigue strength, it can take uh, quite a long time because you need to test multiple specimens. You need to cycle uh, up to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 uh, cycles. So it takes quite a long time. However, to obtain the localization of the plasticity during the first cycle, it can be uh, uh, quite fast if you have the right tool. So it's a, a way to um, investigate uh, the, the fatigue strength of uh, an alloy or the fatigue efficiency on alloy to rapidly find if this alloy will be effective in fatigue or not. And then you can start to uh, um, identify mechanisms that will uh, fit favor the localization or not. You can also start to see if you can design alloy that may um, uh, reduce the localization of the plasticity. Meaning that if you can have an alloy with high yield strength, but with a very low localization of the plasticity, then you may be, have, you may be able to develop an alloy which is fat efficient in fatigue, and that also display a very high yield strength. So let me show you one example. So you can play on the microstructure to uh, minimize the localization of the plasticity. So here is a specific microstructure we use in nickel-based superalloy. And this microstructure is observed to uh, have um, better mechanical proper uh, fatigue strengths than other conventional microstructure when you have equiax grain. So here you have large grain. Um, and the, around this large grain, you have very small grains. So it's for this we call this a necklace microstructure. In this large grain, you have uh, high density of dislocation. You have high uh, level of lattice rotation. And it was first surprising to observe this, that this alloy display higher fatigue strength than conventional alloy with the same average grain size, because if you have large grain, most of the time you tend to develop very high localization and the fatigue life is always uh, lower. So we did this high resolution digital image correlation measurement on uh, this specific alloy. And we noticed that despite this large grain, uh, you indeed develop sleep, but the sleep bands, they do not cross entirely the grain. They, you tend to develop multiple uh, sleep bands with very low intensity. So you can see one example here. So the sleep band doesn't go across the entire grain. You develop multiple sleep bands. You can see another example here. It seems like on the strain map, it's only one sleep event. But if you look at the uh, amplitude of the localization here using the VSI DIC, 
you can see you have multiple sleep events. And these sleep events, they display lower intensity. And as a consequence, if you have low intensity uh, per sleep, you obtain higher fatigue stress. So this kind of tool is a way to uh, investigate the effect of the microstructure on the fatigue stress. And then you can start to play around uh, processing uh, of your metals to form specific microstructures that will, that will minimize your, the localization of the facility. And is what we did on this example here, where we um, develop uh, gamma prime precipitate, large precipitate here, uh, near twin boundaries. Twin boundary in this kind of alloy, it's where you develop the highest uh, sleep localization and is where you initiate cracks. And by doing that, you actually uh, break sleep in a multiple part here, in two parts here, you can see here with this white arrow. And as a consequence, the intensity per sleep is uh, lower and you can improve significantly the fatigue property. Uh, there is also another way to uh, minimize the localization of the plasticity and to improve the fatigue strength is by um, changing the chemistry of your alloy. And I just want to show you one example here, and I'm, uh, we are still working on that. Uh, but if you look at this data on the right here, so you have the yield strength and you have the uh, maximum intensity on the x-axis. You notice that for FCC and HCP, most of the time you develop very high intensity in average and for the highest value. But for BCC, you tend to develop uh, in average very low intensity. However, when you have high yield strength material in BCC, you still develop quite a high. The highest intensity are quite high. And for instance, here is this, it's a multi MPE alloys, multi principal element alloys. And this alloy display uh, during the first uh, uh, cycle here, quite high intensity for the highest value. In average, it's quite low. And as a consequence, because you have this very high intensity, the fatigue strength is very similar to FCC or HCP alloys. However, if you can prevent this very high intensity, you may be able to develop uh, this ideal strength alloy or ideal strength alloy uh, with very high efficiency in fatigue. And so it's what we try to do right now. Uh, and I just want to detail, and I will conclude on that, this specific alloy, this multi-principal element alloy. Uh, when you capture, when you do DIC measurement on this, this alloy, you, you notice that most of the grain, uh, you develop very low intensity. So what I display here, each dot, it's a grain, and the color indicates the maximum intensity uh, for the sleep event that develop inside this grain. And the position in the inverse pole figure display uh, indicates the orientation of the grain, crystallographic orientation of the grain. And you observe that few grains, they develop very high intensity. And these grains are the grains that initiate crack in this kind of uh, alloy. And so if you can prevent this grain to develop high intensity, you may be able to develop an alloy with a very high efficiency in fact. It's quite complex in BCC uh, because you activate, you can activate multiple sleep system, uh, you can activate uh, non-crystallographic uh, plane, etc. But at this point, we are trying to control the chemistry, to control the texture, to avoid this kind of uh, high localization in this BCC uh, alloy. And if we can do this, we expect to uh, develop an alloy which is very efficient in fact. With this, I will just conclude and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. We can start the discussion. Uh, any questions in the audience at the OA? And in the meantime, if there are any questions online, you can always post it in the chat. And uh, any questions in the audience?
Simon, do you want to speak? Yes, I mean, can you, can you ask? Yep. Hi, Marat. Yes. Hi, John Charles. Hi. Beautiful talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Every time I see stuff from you, it's it's, it's beautiful. Um, so I had a, a quick a quick question. So for your you know high resolution DIC, you're obviously just looking at surface, you know, deformations where the the slip, you know, is is less constrained. I mean, how do you, do you think that you know internally the the slip conditions may change within the material away from the surface where there's more constraint yeah you're totally right and it's uh and especially in this uh, very high cycle fatty regime uh so typically if you test in the let's say in high cycle fatty regime uh, or low cycle fatty regime you initiate at the surface so the extrusion they are controlling uh, the fatigue life in the high cycle fatty regime, you always have a uh, uh, competition between internal initiation and surface initiation because you do not develop enough extrusion at the surface uh, yeah. to, really, yeah. to really initiate a crack. And you have, as you mentioned, you have constraint of slip um, inside the grain. And then you have, with the number of cycles, you have uh, accumulation of plasticity in the neighboring grain, et cetera. So we try to now to investigate that using other tool because DIC, uh, of course, you cannot capture that. Um, it's very difficult to uh, quantify this. So the tool we are using are, are synchrotron based. Yeah. Or, yeah. You do, or, yeah. or you need to do a cross section and to do EBSD, but by doing the cross section, you actually uh, you can release your uh, stress. Right, right. So synchrotron base is uh, where we go. Uh, and right now, we can capture the slip event. I may have, let's see, I may have some slide on that. Let's see if I find one. Uh, oh, I don't have any slide, but you can capture the slip event. You can see them in the bulk. Uh, you can see where they occur and when they occur. However, it's very difficult to quantify the intensity of the localization. So what right. we try to do, and is when, it's, when I say we, it's uh, mainly the people working on the synchrotron, they try to capture the lattice rotation field uh, that may, that is also a signature of uh, the intensity of the localization. So they can capture the, the location of this sentence, the, the slip band, for instance, and you can also capture the lattice rotation around the grain or inside the grain. So it's certainly we need to go in this direction to investigate the difference between surface and uh, and uh, bulk. Yeah. And I want to mention that it's also very important for other property when you investigate yields, because for instance, the transmission at the surface, we start to notice that it's very different from the transmission, slip transmission in the bulk. So we need this kind of tool to uh, start to look inside uh, material and, and to be able to capture the localization of the plasticity. No, I, I agree. And then one more quick follow-up. So um, you've done a lot of work basically doing, you know, uniaxial fatigue, but, you know, for real components, the stress states are much more complex. Have you ever considered doing, you know, tension torsion where yeah. there's a major shear component as well? Yes, it's exactly. We are we are going in this direction now. Uh, so try to do more complex loading. Uh, yeah, torsion is, is a, one of them, and also to go to a higher temperature, or to go to lower temperature to see the effect of the temperature. It's something uh, uh, quite important. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to to work. So this kind of tools they can apply for. It's very versatile. So you can do. The yeah. different kind of uh, loading condition. Uh, high temperature sometimes is a little bit changing. You need to work in vacuum and etc. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's um, what we should do. I agree. Beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I can jump in with a question. Thanks very much for the nice talk. I. Um, it's a little bit outside my area, the, but I'm curious for the high entropy alloys, if there's a com, 
if there's a chemical component to where the slip initiates, in other words, if you have these five different elements there, even though we say they're sort of homogeneous, but of course at the atomic level, and I'm a transmission electron <laughs> microscopist, at the atomic level, of course, there'll be, you know, there won't be, there'll be small nano clusters. Uh, is there any evidence that that chemical heterogeneity might play a major role in the mechanical deformation? Yeah, so it does for sure. Uh, we don't know exactly the link yet. Uh, yeah. It's very complex in this high entropy alloy. It can be a lattice friction, it can be short range order, or, and it's especially when you deal with a BCC here. Um, what we are the point where we understand that you have specific crystallographic orientation that develop very high intensity of localization here. And then as a consequence, your fatty property, for instance, is, uh, is not that good for a BCC alloy. You tend to expect a BCC alloy to have good fatty property, but for this kind of alloy, it's not the case. And But we don't know yet why you obtain in certain grain uh, very low localization, in another grain very high localization. And the difference is huge. Uh, when you look at the value, uh, the amplitude of the location can vary from like few nanometers to uh, hundred of nanometers. I mean, do you get, do you get green boundary system? <laughs> Uh, it you, seems that you, if you consider all the different angles and all the different types of grain, it seems incredibly, uh, yeah, you, is there any easy way to sort that out? Yeah, so we, we work on with this specific alloy because it has been processed in a way that is uh, quite homogeneous. Uh, you don't have too much of the grain boundary segregation uh, between one orientation to another one. You don't have changes in, uh, high changes in, uh, in chemistry or in uh, other small scale features, microstructure features. So, but indeed, I mean, you're right. It's uh, very difficult to uh, work with this high entropy alloy. We still need to learn a lot on the microstructure. We just now start to realize that uh, depend on the microstructure, depend on the crystallographic orientation, depends on the slip system activated and et cetera. Um, depend on the, dis on the dislocation move in this kind of alloy, you can have a very different uh, behavior in uh, in your plastic localization. Mm -hmm. And plastic localization control a lot of pro mechanical properties. So if you have different behavior, you will have different uh, mechanical property. And sometimes it can change, you see, from one grain to another. It's here, you just have a change in crystallographic orientation. So the dislocation, they move, they move the, I mean, the intrinsic behavior is the same. Mm. So it's, it's very affected a lot. In FCC, crystallographic orientation affect. Uh, I'm sorry, my, uh, my laptop, the battery of my laptop went down. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so I just, yeah, I, I was mentioning that uh, for, uh, high entropy alloy uh, is quite complex, and the uh, microstructure, especially at the small scale, affect uh, plastic location quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you had a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so just a generic question, uh, JC. Great talk, actually. I, I, Thank you. One of my areas where I also work. So, good to see you. So. Uh, you did talk about super alloys, and uh, it seems like you are because you are investigating fatigue, and whereas super alloys, when we talk of super alloys in general, we are always interested in high temperature applications. So have you also considered uh, investigating the creep fatigue interactions in these materials? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I, uh, I did uh, in the past uh, quite a lot, uh, the fatigue of high temperature. Uh, what's happened is that, um, well, you have other mechanisms, uh, oxidation and et cetera. Uh, but when you increase the temperature, um, on this kind of alloy, let's say for disc alloy, so you go to let's say 650 uh, degrees C, um, sometimes oxidation controls the lifetime, but um, most of the time you still initiate uh, with the crystallographic facet and et cetera. And the fatigue life 
increase with the temperature, with increase of in temperature, because you develop less localization with temperature. And the relationship works very well also when you increase the temperature in this nickel based superalloy. I need to check for all the alloy, but for nickel based superalloy, meaning that at room temperature, fatty property of nickel based superalloy is, is very critical. Uh, it's for this we investigate this also at room temperature. Um, and when you go to higher temperature, the location of the plasticity by sleep decreases, and you have higher fatigue life. So it's very surprising, up to the point where you activate uh, oxidation mechanism, where in this case the fatigue life can decrease uh, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, it's um, we, it's still necessary to investigate uh, fatigue property of nickel-based superalloy at room temperature, because sometimes the parts uh, they are not that hot or in the center of the disc and et cetera. And this is where you initiate uh, cracks. If you talk about very high temperature, 1000 degrees C for the blade and et cetera, that's something, something else. Uh, creep is also uh, something else. And here are, it's more mechanism at a very small scale because you, main, you maintain or you have single crystal or DS alloy. So, uh, and it's all related to precip precipitate and et cetera. So it's more difficult to apply this kind of tool and to relate yeah. property to uh, uh, localization. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any last question? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, JC. Thank you, JC. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks.